<clears throat> Sandra Nomoto is the content doctor, a writer, editor, and publicist who works with social and environmentally conscious organizations. She published the first vegan marketing book after discovering such a book didn't exist. Besides being well-versed in all things vegan, Nomoto is a founding member of the Vancouver Short Film Festival. She also worked on the Vancouver International Women in Film Festival and Spotlight Awards, and she was awarded the Women in Film and Television Vancouver, the 2009 Volunteer of the Year. Her mission is to make a positive impact on the world and its resources. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you so much, Debbie. What what a lovely intro, and it's my absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. <clears throat> so you grew up in Canada. Were your, were your parents born here? No, my parents were born in the Philippines, and they immigrated to Montreal in the late 70s. So interestingly, my, my mom, uh, her first job as a nurse was in Arkansas, and uh, was sort of a long distance relationship. My dad followed her. They got married there. And then they immigrated to Montreal on the East Coast, which is where my sister and I were born. And my aunt was the one who initially immigrated to Montreal, made us all Canadian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tita Jean. After I was born, we moved to Vancouver, to the West Coast, because even though my mom was getting a good hang of the French, they just decided it's, it's too cold here. We can't tolerate the winters. So <laughs> they heard it was a bit better on the West Coast. And that's where I've called home ever since. Was it important to them that you also keep their culture and traditions from what they brought over? I would say more so for my mom rather than my dad. I think when he left the Philippines, he was ready for a new life, um, wanted to leave it behind. And and I'm sure, you know, unintentionally through the food, especially that he cooked. My dad was a big cook. Definitely the cuisine was in our household growing up. I do know my mom tried her best to teach us Tagalog, which is the main dialect there. But because English was our first language, she sort of tried secondarily to then throw in Tagalog. And by then, I think I had such a mastery of English already. Like she taught my siblings and I to read at three years old. So oh, we, wow. yeah. So even before preschool, we were already reading books <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was getting strange looks from the kids in preschool. I remember that whenever I took out a book and was reading, I think by that time I was sort of like, no, I'm not feeling this second language at home. <laughs> I regret it now as an adult, not being able to pick that up. And of course it's never too late. I can always learn that language. And being in school in Canada, we learned French. And so the language I never was able to pick up, but certainly different cultures aspects. It's really hard to learn a new language when you're an adult, at least for me. I just marvel at the people that come over that have to learn it as an adult. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> so what was the type of food? What was the food like? What was your cuisine like? I think we had a pretty Canadian breakfast, either would be like sausage, eggs, toast, or the cereal with the milk, like very easy. Sometimes I remember special days like Saturday mornings, my parents would sometimes make pancakes and that was a real treat. For lunch, it was mostly sandwiches, you know, whether peanut butter and jelly. So very Canadian. Um, yeah, yeah. Deli meats, sometimes like chopped up meat stuffed in there <laughs> between the two pieces of bread. Rarely it was like... um like leftovers because yeah when in elementary school we didn't have a microwave in high school we did so yeah. I could do that but uh, yeah dinner time both my parents were great cooks but I think my dad mostly was in the kitchen more because of the work hours that my mom had so dinner often looked like rice some sort of vegetable and then a saucy meat dish very traditional Filipino kind of food. I want to talk to you a little bit about representation so when you were growing up did you see others that look like you in the media and entertainment? And if you didn't, and if you did, how did that impact you? 
Uh, certainly, I remember seeing Asians in the media. He knows not so much. I remember, I think in the sixth grade, that's when the the movie Wayne's World came out and Tia Carrer uh, played one, you know, Wayne's girlfriend, maybe not maybe a main char- character, a supporting character. And that was a big deal. Ooh, she's Filipina. She's, <laughs> she's in this movie. But in terms of our community, yeah, I was raised Catholic. And so, of course, Catholicism is huge in the Filipino community. I also grew up for 13 years in a Catholic Catholic school where the majority of our school were Filipinos. So that was normal for me seeing a majority Filipino community around me. And I later learned as an adult how rare that was because I would hear stories of like I was the only Filipino person in my class, sometimes the only Asian person in my class. That's completely different from how I was raised. I know now that was quite rare, the community in which I grew up. Yeah, it's huge. I think representation is huge. What did you think you would be doing when you became an adult? Like we all have this thought about what we're going to be. What did you think you were going to be? I'm the kind of person where I never really had like, oh, I want to be this ever since I was a child. I sort of thought of like, oh, an artist seems kind of cool. An astronaut seems really cool. (laughs) As I entered high school, I really had no idea. And and I was a very good student. I was an almost straight A student. So that can actually make it harder <laughs> because when you're good at most subjects, you're kind of like, I don't know what I want to do. But I think closer to the end of high school, I knew science was not for me. I really enjoyed English, English literature. I was an AP English, even though I was an AP calculus as well. Again, just I would rather write an essay than do math problems. So that just kind of gave me a sign. Oh, I should go into the arts when I went into university. And even when I was in college, most of those years, I had no idea where was where I was headed. When I majored in English, a lot of people asked me, oh, so you're going to teach? And I went, nope, don't want to teach. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to be good at English. And then I added my other major was film studies because mm-hmm. I didn't know that there were film programs until my third year. That brought me back to the times when on weekends, my dad would rent movies and my dad was an electrician by trade. And so he had the best technology possible in terms of speakers, music for music, you know, we had, of course, VHS or or sorry, VCRs for VHS tapes. But then later on, my dad got a laser disc player, like anything that was new in tech, my dad would really hop on. And so our basement was sort of this home theater that he created. And it was a really special experience for us growing up to be able to watch movies in an almost theater like experience. And that really influenced me when I discovered, oh, you can get a degree in film studies, you watch movies and you write essays about them like that, like I thought that was the coolest thing. So So that was my second major. And I thought when I graduated, uh, maybe doing something around communications and film and publicity, film publicity, that type of thing. And so once I graduated, I happened to get an internship right away at a public relations firm in Vancouver, which had a lot of film industry clients. So that was my first job right out of school. And then that actually led me down the road of public relations and communications where I'm in now. So what is it about public relations? It is an interesting, defining it is interesting because all my PR pro friends have a difficult time. (laughs) We all do have, it's not one thing. It's putting, yes, it's putting a company's face or a brand's face, best face forward type of thing. Why is it so hard to describe what it is? (laughs) I think because it's something intangible that, you as a company, you can do what you can do on your end, but you don't know how people are going to interpret it. So the definition, if I remember correctly, of public relations is the relationship between an organization and its public. And so an or- most people think PR is, oh, you send a news release to the media and they'll cover your, your business or your, your story in some way. And that's definitely one part of it, you know, being covered by the media. But the other part of it is, is how does the public perceive you? And yeah. you have no control of that. Like, obviously, if you do something unethical or scandalous, that's not going to fare well for you. People are going to have a bad perception of you. But the more positive things you do, hopefully that would result in a positive perception. So we're in this interesting world right now where we have, we didn't have back and forth tools with our audience. Now we have social media where almost instantaneously you put a post out and within an hour, you might get a comment from someone saying, 
whatever their opinion is about it. Now we have a lot more tools that contribute to public relations than we did before. I think that's a good thing because now you have companies have more of a grasp of what the people, what the public does think about them versus before when they were trying to control their perception, yeah. but you had the media as an in-between. You couldn't go directly to your public. And the media didn't necessarily have that dialogue like they do now with their audience. So the audience, for better or for worse, can hold a brand accountable for their for whatever they do. So <laughs> all of this kind of meshes together the writing, the PR and the filmmaking. So have you written any scripts yourself? And do you have any log lines kind of hidden away in a drive folder? <laughs> No, I dabbled in just practicing screenplay. Yeah, I did take one screenplay course in university. Again, writing is something I enjoy, all types of medium, but but yeah. It's different. I right? probably <laughs> wasn't going to be a screenplay writer because I don't have that brain for coming up with characters and how deep they go and where they are and what they're doing. I was very much that type of writer when I was a child. So I did short stories. I did poetry right up until the end of high school. And I think landing in public relations, I shouldn't say kill, but it kind of diminished that more creative type of writing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now my creativity is more towards how to be more persuasive on behalf of my clients. I was working on a screenplay, a short screenplay about pre-colonial Philippines, because a number of years ago, I wanted to just dig a little bit deeper into my ancestry, my mom's in particular. So I discovered a whole bunch of things about what yeah, pre-colonial times were like. And so I started to write a screenplay, but I found it hard to finish. <laughs> so that's just sitting off in my computer in a folder. And yeah, I, I, people ask me now that I've released my second book, oh, do you have an idea for a third book? And I do. However, I think it would be better as a documentary and maybe a book as a companion to that documentary. So that's, yeah, that's my next idea. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I have to say I'm trying to learn to screenwrite. I've written a couple of shorts and oh, great. Uh, I've been scared out of my mind having them critiqued by my stage 32 peers. And it's so hard for me because you're right. It's so I've been writing nonfiction my whole life and I've written 18 books. So it's not like I'm not new to writing, but this it's taking that vision from telling I mean, you show, but you tell also, you can tell what people are thinking and whatnot in nonfiction or in other stories, but in screenwriting, you have to write what you see on the screen. And yeah. I just find that so hard. So I'm trying, it's stretching my boundaries and I'm trying. So That's kudos to you also for trying. <laughs> Because I know how hard it is. <laughs> what is your favorite part about being involved with that short film festival? And how did you decide to get involved? So, yeah, my time with the festival started in university. During my final year, I had a colleague. Both of us worked in the UBC call center where we would call alumni and ask for donations. And I knew he was in the film program and he came up to me and said, Hey, you know, I'm starting this student film festival. I know, you know how to ask for money. So do you want to help me with sponsorship? <laughs> so that's how he wrote me in. So the first three years that the festival operated, it was the Vancouver Student Film Festival, showcasing, you know, films by students, post-secondary students across the province. And he actually registered the, the nonprofit organization in the second year as the Vancouver Short Film Festival, because that did not exist. And he knew that eventually he wanted to welcome or bring in all types of short films. And so I think that was a really smart move. And 2009 was the first year that we produced that, that film festival. My role changed from being sponsorship coordinator to marketing director, because at the time, that's where my career was going. When he moved back to the US, where he's from, um, our founder, uh, I stepped up as festival director. And then from there, 
moved more into a board role. So we had to establish a board of directors. And so by the time that I departed the organization in 2015, I was chair. I was chair mm. of the board. I'm so happy to report the festival is still operating. It did two virtual festivals during the pandemic. It was still running online for, for all of us to watch at home, which was great. Mm. It's still operating. I actually just heard back from the, the chair. Uh, she was looking to uh, record some archives from the early years. So she reached out to us about that. It's really amazing to see an organization that you've been with from the start really flourish into fully fledged organizations. So really exciting. That's very cool. And of course, you're in Vancouver. So you're in a motion picture hub and t television hub. <laughs> yeah, a Hollywood lot North. A lot of stuff gets made it. there. Yeah. <clears throat> Hollywood of the North. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about being vegan. You've eaten meat. You grew up eating meat. So when did you make that choice to stop meat and, and being more vegan? At the end of 2007, I was invited to see a screening of the documentary Earthlings. And oddly, it was my ex-boss at the PR firm who invited me and her husband at the time um, was a local filmmaker. And he had seen this movie on his own and decided, you know, I want to share this with more people. So he put on a screening of it at the University of British Columbia and she invited me. I had no idea what I was going to see. I just thought <laughs> this was an opportunity to catch up with her. And yeah, I was just really moved by the documentary. I will never forget 10 minutes into the movie, these really big UBC athletes. I don't know if they were football or basketball players, but they walked out of the theater with their blue and yellow jackets and were like, yeah, we're, we're not going to tolerate this. And I thought, well, if they can't sit and watch this footage, I'm going to. I sat, I, I saw the footage. And what was really powerful was at the end of the documentary, a woman from the Vancouver Humane Society was there to answer questions. And somebody asked, what is the one thing we can do to help these animals? And she said, stop eating meat. And just that simple answer just re was really powerful for me. So my goal after that, seeing that movie was to go fully vegan, but I didn't set a timeline for myself. So it's hard. Yeah. I just thought to myself, yeah, this is the most ethical way to live as a vegan. Um, I don't know how this is going to be a personal goal of mine. So it took me about two years to fully cut meat out of my diet. And then for a good number of years, I was learning to cook vegan or vegetarian during the week. And then on weekends, I might eat some seafood, some eggs or some dairy. That's how I ate for many years. And in 2017, my husband and I went on our honeymoon to New York City and we ate at Iron Chef Morimoto's restaurant. I had the best seafood meal of my life. And I said, you know what, it's not going to get any better than this. So I'm going to leave on a high note. And that was my last seafood meal. So that was 2017. And then from there, it was just dairy. So pizza and ice cream, some of my favorite foods. <laughs> and it wasn't until I went to my naturopath because over a number of years, unrelated to my dietary transitions, I've had this undiagnosed digestive condition. It involves mm -hmm. bloating, really painful acid reflux, heartburn, and sometimes even vomiting. So I just had this really bad bout in the spring of 2018 and went back to her and I said, I need some answers. And she said, let's do a food sensitivity test. So I did this test, found out that I was sensitive to dairy, among other things. And I later learned most people of color are intolerant to dairy in really? some form. Yeah, it's I wonder it's, why that is. Um, well, it's to do with the protein, most likely the protein that's in dairy. It's very hard to yeah, it, it once you pass kind of the infant stage, it just becomes very difficult to digest. I did a four month cleanse of all of these supposedly, you know, sensitive foods, and then reintegrated them back into my diet to see if any of them were the cause of of my problems. But I found myself after those four months saying, Hey, I was able to do four months without dairy. So I guess I can be vegan now. <laughs> so that was the start of my journey as a vegan. And from there, not consuming clothing or household products that involve animals that becomes much easier. Of course, the first hurdle is food. So yeah, that was spring 2018. And I'm almost five years living as a vegan now. And of course, your body has to adjust to this too, because you need the protein. 
<laughs> yes. Your body no, needs protein. protein. Your body needs all the things like with bread, you still need starch. You can't live without starch and protein. <laughs> Yeah. Carbs, protein, fats, vegetables, fruits and vegetables, all of that is possible if you eliminate animals. So given how much attention is made to the vegan industry and how it's growing, were you surprised there wasn't a marketing book? Yes, I was. Of course, things today look very different than when I started my journey. When I started, there weren't very many plant-based meat alternatives in my grocery store. Now there are so many. It's hard to go to a grocery store and not find any. It's much different now. So in 2021, when I came up with the idea for this book, of course, I searched to see if somebody had already written it. And not only was there no marketing (laughs) book about the vegan industry, there was only one book about vegan business called Vegan Ventures, which Katrina Fox published back in, I believe, 2016. And so I went, really? Like, this is it? This is the one book? And my book could potentially be the second. I read her book and it really inspired me because the structure of her book where she includes a lot of case studies with case studies of existing vegan businesses was exactly the idea that I wanted to do for my book. Seeing her already do it. I went, okay, great. I've got a model for it already. And so at the end of September, 2021, I started sending out my first few requests for, for marketing stories. And then by January, 2022, I had finished my manuscript and then the book was published in November. Right on. What are the most important things you want people to take away from the experience you have had as making that decision? As a vegan? Yeah. I've never been asked that. Think if you are looking for a way that you can be more compassionate to everyone who inhabits this earth and everything, and you also want to live a more ethical lifestyle, this is the way to do it. So of course, the definition of vegan is removal of animal products and exploitation of animals as much as possible from your lifestyle. So that means food, that means not supporting any companies that test on animals, that means not going to zoos or aquaria or any racing events that involve racing or sporting events that involve animals. But I will say that as a result of doing that, you have a huge impact on the animals, number one. Um, Science has now found that the, the healthiest diet that prevents most of the chronic diseases we face today is a plant-based diet. So now we have health and science on our side. And thirdly, climate change. I mean, our earth is not getting any cooler. And one of the reasons why it's warmed so much is the contribution of animal agriculture. And I'm not saying, you know, everybody on this listening to this needs to go vegan, but if you can consider trying to remove as many animal products from your diet as possible that, you know, if everybody in the world did that, that would have a huge reduction of emissions and really help out the planet. And so those are the three major reasons why people come to veganism. There are others. It helps people lift people out of horrible working conditions. Think about poverty and people who still don't have access to food security and clean water. We could be diverting some of the food that we actually feed to animals to people in need. So there are many, many other reasons why living a vegan lifestyle is beneficial for you and for everyone around you. Of course, in Canada, the cost of meat, that's a deterrent in its own. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, you know, I need to keep saying this, but yeah, eating vegan, it can be great on your wallet. You know, (laughs) if you're not eating the processed stuff, like some of that processed stuff can be quite expensive, even though it's tasty. Think about your rice, your beans, your vegetables. I know certain vegetables are are more expensive than others, but if you think about those basics, you know, grains, quinoa, all of these things are very inexpensive. And so if you want your wallet to feel a little lighter, try eating a more plant-based diet. Because it's cheaper. (laughs) Their uh, social impact and environmental consciousness are issues really important to a large portion of the buying market. How frustrating is it that legislators are ignoring climate change and carrying on as if it's 1961? Is it if it's nefarious and by design? What do you think our options are? 
Wow, what a big question. I I'm know, reading... we were not going to have the answer, but what, do you, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? I'm reading The un Uninhabitable Earth as we speak. And I'm telling you, it's going to be a really scary place in the next 70 years if we cannot turn this around. I don't have any kids. I don't plan to, but I have a niece and a nephew. And I really am afraid for the world that they're heading into because we've only just started to see natural disasters and it's it's going to get much, much worse. So, so there's that. Uh, yes, government has a role to play. Absolutely. And they can definitely be more harsh on some of the big corporate players that are responsible for all of this and they could play a part. However, you as the consumer, you play the biggest part because if you are supporting corporations that you know damage the planet, that includes animal agriculture. Um, yeah, that is the part that we can play. Maybe we can't give up our cars today, but the next car that you buy, maybe consider making that electric. Of course, as I've said, everything you eat on your plate has an impact. I think power in numbers, that's really how we can do it. Because if we can show corporations, we don't want to support you if you're doing these actions, then they won't be around. They won't be around to do it. And so that's the only thing that I can say. We may never change the world into vegan. So how can we lobby to change how animals are raised for meat and how they are treated? Yeah, I just saw a documentary called Meet Me Halfway, M-E-A-T, over the weekend. And I didn't know until I saw this documentary that there are organizations that are trying to create certifications for those in the animal agriculture industry. Mm -hmm. And so those who, yeah, as, as you've said, are treating the animals better before they, they're slaughtered. I think that's a great first step. But again, if you can just reduce <laughs> the number of animals on your plate, think about maybe weekdays eating plant-based and then limiting your animal intake to the weekends, or some people do after 6 PM only, you know, find what find a way to make it work for you if everybody could get to the point where we're eating plant-based 80 percent of the time we would still see a huge impact in terms of the reduction of the industry and the impact on both the animals and climate change so i would love for everybody to get to that level if you can go vegan great but if not yeah if we could get to that point that would be really amazing just reduce it yeah yeah what is <clears throat> what is something that people underestimate or get wrong about you and your messaging? Hmm. Yeah, I don't think anybody gets anything wrong, but I do, I do get odd questions. So uh, the first boat, the first batch of clients are businesses that are who I work with. The other batch are authors. So I have a number of services that help authors publish their books. And I think that's the batch that I get the strangest questions because people are not aware of how the the publishing industry works. Mm -hmm. So the self-publishing industry is still very new and that's a whole different path if you choose that one versus the traditional path where you approach a publisher and you say, I have a book idea. And if they like that idea, then you you sign a contract, you know, maybe you get paid up front and then you publish your book and they cover most of the services for you. Whereas and they take all the money. <laughs> they take a lot of it. That's true. Most of it. <laughs> uh, and whereas if you go the self-publishing path, you're responsible for every step of publishing your book. And so I think that's where a lot of people have a lot of questions. They think, oh, do I still need an agent? And, mm -hmm. and which step becomes, or, or which step become, or, which step is before the next? And so I get a lot of questions around that. And and that's why I started services because I spent a lot of time answering these questions for clients, even though it wasn't part of my work. <laughs> so if you have questions like this around self-publishing, I'd be happy to help. And what is the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, wow. I, I do remember someone telling me that the way that I operate my business is very reflective of the values that I espouse as a person. And I think that's really the best. Yeah. That's one of the best compliments I've heard that was over 10 years ago, but uh, yeah, something I'll never forget. Oh, that's awesome. 
Thank you so much, Sandra. I really appreciate you taking this time. It was great to get to know you. Thanks so much, Debbie. You're so welcome. And it was my absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you.